In this lesson, we are going to discuss graphs associated with relations. What are graphs? A graph is an ordered pair, VE, where V is the set containing all the vertices and E is the set containing all the edges. If we have an edge, let's call this V1 and this is V2, we say that these are the endpoints of the edge V1, V2. If the elements of E are considered to be ordered pairs, then G is called a directed graph or a digraph. Here is an example of a directed graph. So in this case, you have the edge 1, 2, but you do not have the edge 2, 1 because the arrow only goes from 1 to 2. Whereas in this case, this is just considered as the same. So instead of using an ordered pair, we will just denote this edge as 1, 2 to indicate that the order does not really matter. Now, graphs model relations between the objects, with the objects being represented by the vertices of the graphs. Two objects are related if and only if there is an edge between them. What it means is that in our graph, A will be related to B if we have the ordered pair AB element of the set of edges. So therefore, every non-empty relation R can be represented by a digraph and vice versa. If we have a graph, we can define a relation on the set of vertices. And conversely, if we have a relation, we can get its corresponding graph. Suppose that we have the relation R on the set A, where A is the set containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and our relation is given by this. A is related to B whenever A divides B. Let me first write down the elements of R as an ordered pair. We have 1 divides everything. up to 1, 5, and then for 2, we have 2 divides 2, and 2 divides 4, for 3, 3 divides itself, 4 divides itself, and 5 divides itself. This is our relation. How will we now look at its corresponding graph? I have 5 elements. Say this is my vertex 1, 2, 4, 3, and 5. First, we have the ordered pair 1, 1. So I will be using arrows to denote that it is a directed graph. I have 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, and 1, 5. Next, we have 2, 2. We have 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 4, and 5, 5. So these are all arrows. So we call those loops. How does the digraph of an equivalence relation look like? So, so far, we just know that if you have a relation, then you can, you can have a digraph. But what if we have a special kind of a relation? We have an equivalence relation. What will the digraph look like? First, an equivalence relation is reflexive. So therefore, there should be a loop at every vertex in your graph. So if we have this element A, we know that there should be a loop. Next, an equivalence relation has to be symmetric. So therefore, if we have the edge V1, V2, so I'm using this arrow, if we have the edge V1, V2, this direction, we should also have V2, V1 because it is symmetric. If it is symmetric, we just remove the arrows and we just denote it as an edge like that. Next, it has to be transitive. So therefore, if I have V1, V2, these two are related and we have V2, we have V2 related to V3, then we must have the edge V1 
related to V3. So let's look at the following graphs and determine whether this is an equivalence relation. An equivalence relation has to be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So first, is it reflexive? We must be looking for loops. However, this one we have 0 to 0. So that's actually equivalent to a loop. And 1 here, 1 is related to 1. So it, we have a loop there. And then 2 also. 2 is related to 2. So we have a loop there. However, we do not have a loop for the remaining vertices. And therefore, this is not reflexive. Next, is it symmetric? So if we look at 3, 0, but we do not have 0, 3. Therefore, this is also not symmetric. I will no longer check if this is transitive. I will leave it up to you as an exercise. But our point is that we have already shown that it is not reflexive and it is also not symmetric. So therefore, this is not an equivalence relation. How about the next example? Is it reflexive? Yes, we have A, B, C, D, and E. We all have loops. Is it symmetric? Yes. Because as you can notice here, the arrows are always two ways. Is it transitive? Notice that you always have like a path here. So E and A are related, A and B are related, and we have E and B. So let's check the others. This, this, we have this. And then you can verify also that for the rest, you always have a triangle formed here. So like this, if A is related to C, A is related to D, therefore D is related to C. This one will be an equivalence relation. Suppose that we have a graph with vertex set V and edge set E. A totally component of G is a pair V1, E1, so meaning to say it is also a graph itself. And notice here that V1, that's a subset of your vertex set and E1 is a subset of your edge set. Now what happens here? It says for all V1, V2, and V1, it must be true that V1, V2 is an element of E1. This means that if you get two vertices in V1, then they must always be related. So for example, this is a totally connected component, this is a totally connected component, and this is a totally connected component. And the reason is, if we get any two elements here, they will always be connected by an edge. So just like in this one, we only have two, they will be connected by an edge. If I get two elements here, they are connected. I, have, I get two elements here, they are also connected. Connected. So this is how a totally connected component looks like. There will always be an edge between any two arbitrary elements. The graph is said to be totally connected if every vertex lies in some totally connected component of G. So going back again to this example, if we just take this as our entire graph G, our G now consists of totally connected components. Let's call these components G1, G2, and G3. Why are we studying totally connected components? This theorem tells us why. A digraph represents an equivalence relation if and only if it has totally connected components. So earlier, Earlier, when we were determining whether a graph is an equivalence relation, we have to check for all the three properties, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. However, this theorem now tells us that just by checking if, it, if our graph has totally connected components, then automatically it will be an equivalence relation. So going back to this example, you might be thinking that, how come this is an equivalent relation? We do not see any loops here. Because remember, for something to be an equivalence relation, we should always have loops. For the rest of the lecture, we will always assume that there is a loop around each edge. 
Now, going back to this example, it will be symmetric because your graphs here will be undirected. If AB is an edge, then BA will also be an edge. And this will be true for undirected graphs. So this one should actually be an undirected graph. Next, we want to show transitivity. For all A, B, C in your set V, if A, B is in R, B, C is in R, then A, C is also in R. Recall that we have A, B is in R. Or A is related to B if and only if we have AB is an edge. So I will just write this as AB is an edge, BC is an edge. So therefore, AC will also be an edge. So let's now get three arbitrary elements, A, B, C, and V. Now from our assumption, G has totally connected components. Let us recall the following. Our premise here is that your graph consists of totally connected components. And what does that mean? It means that if we get our arbitrary element in V, it will always be contained in a totally connected component. This means that A will belong in a totally connected component. However, since A is connected to B, then this B must also belong in that same connected component. Moreover, we have BC. This is an edge. And therefore, A, B, and C must belong in the same connected component. However, what is the meaning of a totally connected component? If we get two arbitrary elements in the set, then it would mean that they will always be connected by an edge. And so, so since G consists of totally connected components, there exists a totally connected component G prime such that A, B, and C will be in G prime. Since a and C now belongs in G prime, then AC must be connected by an edge because that is the definition of a totally connected component. We have just proved this direction. If our undirected graph consists of totally connected components, then it is an equivalence relation. For the converse, if we have an equivalence relation, then it must have totally connected components that will be left as an exercise. Let us determine if the following represents an equivalence relation. And if yes, let us determine its equivalence classes. This is my graph. And notice that it has two totally connected components. This one and... This one, again, I already removed the loops because from now on, we will assume that all of our vertices will have loops on it. Since this graph consists of two totally connected components, therefore, the answer here is yes. This is an equivalence class. And what will be your equivalence classes? The nice thing about now knowing that an equivalence relation will be represented by a graph with totally connected components is that its equivalence classes will be exactly your totally connected component. So, for example, here, what is the equivalence class containing A? All the elements in this set will now be related to A, correct? So, this is A, B, C. D and the equivalence class containing D is just D itself. So we have two totally connected components and these are exactly your equivalence classes.
Now we have just finished discussing how an equivalence relation looks like as a graph. The next question is, what if we have a partial order relation? How will the digraph look like? So first, it has to be reflexive. So again, just like with your equivalence relation, for every vertex V, we will always have a loop. But most of the time, I will no longer draw the loop. It will always be reflexive. Next, anti-symmetry. There is no edge containing both directions. If you have a partial order relation, it has to be undirected. because if you have an edge containing both directions, then this means that V1, V2 is in R. V2, V1 is in R. But anti-symmetric means that they must be the same. But in this case, they are not the same. So this one cannot happen. We should always have one direction only. Next, transitivity. If G contains the vertices V1, V2, and it contains the edge V2, V3, then we should have V1 must be related to V3. An important thing to know about the digraphs of posets is that they never contain a closed path except for loops at individual vertices. Meaning to say, this configuration cannot happen. Okay, you cannot have A is related to B, B is related to C, and then C is related to a. What we only know is that by transitivity, the order should be A is related to B, B is related to C, then it should be A is related to C. Understand, this is not a closed path. If it's like this, 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 and then this. However, if you go A to B, B to C, and C to A, that is a closed path. Let's see why this cannot happen. So suppose there exists A, B, C in your vertex set such that A, B is an edge, B, C is an edge, and C, A is an edge. Now in terms of relation, this means A and B are related, B and C are related, and C and A are related. By transitivity, what do we get here? We get that AC must be in R. So if we combine that with this one, so we have AC is in R and CA is in R. What do we get? Since we have a partial ordering, what is an important property of partial ordering? It has to be anti-symmetric. So since R is anti-symmetric, then we have that A must be equal to C. Since A is equal to C, we will also have that BA is an element of R. If we combine AB is in R, BA is in R, therefore A will also be equal to B. And therefore, what have we shown here? We have shown that this three would all be the same and therefore we only have one vertex. Okay, so this is the direct proof. If we have the proof by contradiction, what we will say is that suppose R is a partial ordering and V and there exists A, B, C with all distinct. So these are all distinct. We are already sure that we really have A triangle like this. But we can now stop here. A is equal to C and that is a contradiction of our initial assumption that they are distinct. So this contradicts our assumption that the three vertices are distinct. So therefore, there is no closed paths in our graph. Let's look at these examples. Let's determine whether this one here is a poset. 
First, let's check if it is reflexive. Yes, all the vertices have loops. Next, is it anti-symmetric? Anti-symmetric means we have no dual edges like that. No? So this is tr true, this anti-symmetric. Is it transitive? I will just make use of this less than or equal to to denote this partial ordering. So if V1 is less than or equal to V2 and V2 is less than or equal to V3, then we must have that V1 is less than or equal to V3. And this is true for all V1, V2, V3 in our vertex set. However, in our example, do we have something like that? Our premise here is always false. This does not happen in our case, correct? So therefore, this is vacuously true. If the premise is false, then automatically this is already true. So therefore, this is transitive. Next, how about the second one? Definitely, this is not reflexive because we do not have this. Is it anti-symmetric? Yes, we do not have a dual edge. Next, is it transitive? No, because look at this. We have 3, 2, 2, 1. Then by transitivity, we should have 3 less than or equal to 1. Next, for the third one, this is also reflexive. For the fourth, fourth one, not reflexive. For the third one, anti-symmetric, yes. This one is no. Because we have dual edge, transitive. We have 1, 3, 3, 2. So we should have a 1, 2, right? So not transitive. And moreover, notice also that we have a closed path here, right? So definitely this is not a partial ordering. So it has a closed path also. So therefore, it is not a partial ordering. So therefore, in this example, only the first one represent a poset. Next, let us look at this relation. A is related to B if and only if, again, A divides B. The relation R is partial but not a linear ordering on A. Let us recall the definition of a linear ordering. It means that if we get two arbitrary elements in A, then it's either A1 is less than or equal to A2 or A2 is less than or equal to A1. Any two arbitrary elements must be related. Why is this not a linear ordering? For example, 4 and 6. 4 is not related to, I will be using the R here, 4 is not related to 6 and 6 is not related to 4. Take note that that is the negation of this one. It will be end. Now, let us draw the graph of our relation here. I already have here the elements of A, then we will just connect them. Okay, what will be the ordered pairs here? 1 divides everything. So 1, 2, 1, 3. We'll connect it to everything. Next, what about 2? 2 divides 4, 2 divides 8, 2 divides 24, 2 divides 6, and 12, and 24. What about 4? 4 divides 8, 4 divides 24, 4 divides 12, and then everything that starts with 8, so 8 divides... 24. Let's look at 3. 3 divides 6. 3 divides 12. 3 divides 24. 6 divides 12. And 6 divides 24 as well. And of course, it is given that we always have loops because the numbers divide themselves.
Okay, so that is how the graph of this relation look like. Just by looking at this graph, it is really very complicated, right? So what we want to do is to simplify the diagrams of both sets. So if we already know that we are dealing with both sets, since every vertex has a loop, we will no longer include them in the graph. Next, since there are no closed paths, we can orient the diagraph so that all the edges point upward. Okay, so meaning to say for this one, I will no longer have to draw the arrow here automatically when I draw that, okay, all the arrows would automatically mean upward. Next, we will remove the edges that are covered by transitivity. So just like for an example here, I will no longer need, let's say 1 divides 8. Because we can get that from 1, 2, 2, 4, 4, 8. And therefore, 1 is connected to 8. So let us now draw the diagram of this relation so that it will be much simpler. First, I will no longer draw the loops here. Next, we will remove the edges that are covered by transitivity. I will only connect 1. 2, 2, and 3. Why is that? Because 2 and 3 are the prime factors. We no longer need to connect one with the other composite numbers because they will either be connected to 2 or to 3. Next, let's look at 2. Okay, definitely we have 2 is related to 4, 4 goes to 8. 8 goes to 24. And notice that I no longer need this because that is already covered by transitivity 2, 4, and 4, 8. I no longer need this one because it's covered by 4 and 8. So this one will automatically follow. Next, we also connect 3 with 6, 6 and 12, and 12 and 24. What is it that we haven't connected yet? So should we still connect 4 and 24? No more. So here, 4 is connected to 12. Is that covered by transitivity? No, because you do not have this path. You do not have a downward arrow, right? So everything is going up. So 4 and 12 are not yet related here. So I need to draw the edge there. What else? How about this edge, 2, 6? Is it already covered here? No, because in order to go to 6, you have to go down, which you cannot do because all the edges are going upwards. So we have to connect 2 and 6. So this is now a simpler version of our graph. We call this the Haas diagram of your partial ordering. How did we get this Haas diagram? We place all the vertices on the page so that all edges point upward relative to the edge and we draw edges as line segments rather than arrows. And we also eliminated all loops as well as all the edges guaranteed by the transitivity of your relation. So here is a Haas diagram of your another relation. Let's call the vertex set S. So this is from A, B up to N. What does this mean? So we have E and then A here. So everything is going upward and let's denote my relation by the less than or equal to relation. So we now say that E is less than or equal to A. Moreover, if you look at F and E, they are not connected by a line, right? And there is no way that you can connect F and E because remember, you cannot go down. You cannot do this one because this would mean that you went down. Remember, all the edges are going upwards. So there is no way you can go from E to F. So we have E is not related to F and F is also not related to E. This is saying that our relation here is not a linear ordering because we were able to get 
two elements that are completely unrelated with each other. Next, let us consider the set 1, 2, 3. Let us construct the Haas diagram for the power set of A. And our partial ordering here is the subset relation. So what are the elements of the power set of A? We have our null set. Next, the singletons. Set containing 1, 2, and 3. And then the set containing 2 elements. So 1, 2, 1, 3, and 2, 3. And lastly, the entire set A. 1, 2, 3. Let us draw our has diagram. We will already remove the loops. The null set is a subset of everything. Do I still need to connect this one? No, because later on, it can be covered already by this edge, right? So we can remove this edge. And next, 1 is a subset of 1, 2. 1, 2 is a subset of this. 3 is a subset of this. And set containing 1, 3. This one is also a subset of that. And this one. And therefore, this is now the Haas diagram for our relation. How does the Haas diagram of a linearly ordered set look like? This is very nice. The reason why it's called a linear ordering is because the Haas diagram will just be a line. If we get two points, there will always be related. So it will just be one straight line.